out of the scene and a double comes in. And he starts going up the stairs, but he's so far in the background, you can't tell who he is. Willie was a joy. Willie left you alone and, you know. And he said things like, don't bother with the shots. I know about the shots, just do the dialogue. You know, don't tell me where to put the camera, and I don't know that. This is heaven. When the opportunity came, I dreamt at it because it was a propaganda film, in a way, for our entry into the war against Hitler. You were not supposed to make propaganda pictures. You were supposed to make commercial pictures. Mrs. Miniver, the character, was plucked out of the Edit, off the editorial pages of the London Times newspaper. She was a popular character. She had her little life and all the amusing things that happened. And then they showed her suddenly with her quiet, peaceful life completely disrupted and shattered by uh, the horrors of the total blitz. In Mrs. Miniver, there was a, a scene of a German pilot who had been shot down over England. And he was discovered by Mrs. Miniver. And this boy seemed to be quite decent and frightened and so on. Well, I got the writers together and we changed the scene to make him one of Mr. Goering's little monsters. In the course of this project, I got a call from Louis B. Mayer. He'd heard about what I was doing, said, you know, we don't hate anybody, we're not in the war. We I said, Mr. Mayor, if I had several Germans in the film, I wouldn't mind having one decent young fellow. But I've only got one German. And if I make this picture, this one German is going to be a typical little Nazi son of a bitch. Pearl Harbor happens. Now we're in the war. I get a call from Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor says, I've been thinking about what you said. <laughs> and Pearl Harbor came to my rescue. We will come. We will bomb your cities. Like Barcelona, Warsaw, Narvik, Rotterdam. Rotterdam we destroy in two hours. And thousands killed. Innocent people. Not innocent. They were against us. Women and children. 30,000 in two hours. And we will do the same thing here. I remember coming out of Mrs. Miniver in the rejection room and crying. And he said, what are you crying for? And I said, because it's such a piece of junk, Willie. And you ought to be so ashamed of yourself. It's such a piece of junk, it's so below you. Hellman's opinion was not shared by the rest of the country. Mrs. Miniver was the most honored film of the year, winning six Oscars, including one for Weiler. Thanks so much, everybody. It makes me very happy to accept the award for Willie. I wish he could be here. He's wanted an Oscar for a long time. And I know it would thrill him an awful lot to be here, probably as much as that fight over Willems often did. Thank you so much. Weiler was 40 years old when he enlisted in the Army Air Corps. He was wild to get involved in this and get to Europe because he felt violently anti-Hitler. He wanted to be a part of the struggle and also because simply by nature, he wasn't about to miss all that that was going on. I was European and Jewish and I didn't enlist as an ordinary soldier. I enlisted as a filmmaker, see if I could make a film that would help the war effort in some small way, and that's what I did. Willie was a fearless man, or if, if he had qualms, why, well, he certainly didn't reveal them. I doubt that he had any. This was a documentary film called The Memphis Bell, which was the name of the B-17, the flying fortress in which I flew with its crew. A staffer lurking behind that cloud, or hiding up in the sun where the glare blinds you, and you can't see them waiting to dive down on you. Fighters at six o'clock. This is what a gunner sees, a speck in the sky. That's a fighter. And then a blink. That means he's firing at you. 2,300 rounds a minute. Try to get all this on film, you forget that they're shooting at you at the same time. 
we had to learn aircraft recognition. So we would shoot at enemy planes and not at our own. You had to be able to take over a machine gun and operate it in 65 below zero weather. I'm on him. Come on, you son of a bitch. It's such a noisy plane, I wasn't prepared uh, for all that, and uh, I went deaf. And then it turns out that he has totally lost the hearing in one ear, and it is impaired in the other. They shipped me home from Italy on a, on, on a, on a surface vessel, not, not by plane. But, uh, well, it could, there were a lot worse cases than, than mine. He really wasn't sure what that would do to him, whether he would be able to continue as a director if he couldn't hear. I have never seen anybody in such a real state of horror in my life as that he never would direct again. And of course, he did direct for many years again. I devised a very simple thing. When I sit by the camera, I have a connection with the sound man and comes to me and I hear what the microphone hears. So I'm, uh, sometimes I hear them talking about me, you know, quietly. <laughs> When I came back, I was still full of the war, and although I was now out of it, I wanted to do something that had something to do with my experience. I was still under contract to Sam Goldwyn. I had one picture left for him to do under my contract. Just as Mrs. Minerva rallied a nation going off to war, the best years of our lives welcomed the nation home in all its pain and glory. It was the film closest to Weiler's heart, and the entire country embraced it. It won Willie his second Oscar, another award for best picture under his direction, and it was big box office. Hey, there's Butch's place. Butch's? Who's that? Gosh, Butch has got himself a neon sign. Have you ever been to Butch's place? No. Well, Butch Engel that runs it, he's my uncle, swell guy. One of the family don't think he's respectful because he sells liquor. <laughs> Very often we do pictures, we don't know our subject well enough. Uh, and in this case, I, I knew my subject. I, had, I learned it the hard way. And, uh, and somehow when you have, when you get personally involved in the story, something gets on the screen that makes it uh, human and real. And you can't put your finger at what it is, but it's the director's personal involvement. Say, how about the three of us going back to Butch's place? We'll have a couple of drinks, and then we can go home. You're home now, kid. Oh, so long. So, so long, Homer. Just a minute, bud. This is the only thing I've ever seen where the picture started, and three minutes later I was dissolved in tears, and 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 I cried for for two hours plus uh, after that, and that was the the, the opening sequence in in uh, best years of our lives. The moment that that guy was out his was out his arms was standing there with the back to the camera, and the parents came out, I was gone, and I'm not I'm not a pushover, believe me. I laugh at Hamlet. Harold Russell, who played the man who lost his hands, he never went overseas. He lost them in training. We preferred to have somebody who was not an actor, but had really lost his hands. And here was an opportunity to use this boy, and he was very good. The picture told uh, on several levels what was going on. It was universal in its significance. Who was? 
that happened when I, when I returned from the war and, and uh, my wife met me in New York. It was at the Plaza Hotel. I opened the door of the room and Willie was walking down the hall and there was this long hall and we met. It was just a little unusual. We had to run to each other. So I thought I'd repeat that. It's no great invention now, but it made the scene very effective. That's the enigma of, of Weiler. He was not a particularly uh, well-read man. As a matter of fact, he hated reading. He was not a particularly studious man. He had, he had no idea about Strasberg methods, about uh, Russian uh, theater, about... Uh, no, he just... There was an instinct in him that told him when it was right, when it felt true. A genius for getting the truth out of an actor getting his very best performance, a very a most sophisticated thing that Willie was after. There was a finesse in that guy which you would not expect if you, if, if you, if you just uh, talked to him across the card table where you talk to him most of the time. Being married to a director like me, I think, is not easy because during the making of a picture, you get so involved, this very little home life. It was as if Willie dove into a deep pool of water and he was about 15 feet deep under there. I can see him vaguely and I try to commu communicate with him by shouting, but I don't get much response back. We try to make up for it between pictures. I never went from one picture to another very quickly. We'd always take a trip somewhere to make up for lost time. When Willie finished a picture, he had a wonderful ability of loving not to work. We traveled, we vacationed, and we would go to Europe on a long trip, and only at the end of, oh, two or three months, he would have the nagging feeling that he better get back to work and support his family again. Everything seems to have come out all right. We had four children, and they are all fine. He had a string, an unparalleled string of, of heads after head after head. So sometimes, you know, when I started directing and people don't quite listen, while or while, the, much to my delight, they confused the two of us. Then he would put the arm around me and says, come on now, money, money, who cares? It was a long time ago, about 30 years ago, that I acted for him only once in the film The Heiress. The Goldwyn contract finished, Weiler became his own producer. All decisions were now his alone, down to the smallest detail. He was very uncertain about my makeup. In fact, James says that the doctor has a beard, so we made some tests. He didn't like this beard. He says it's too round, I think. Well. So every night we went and watched the various tests of the beard, but he couldn't quite make up his mind. He said it should be square, I think. Don't you think square? I said it could be, it could be square. Or it could be, no. I said, it, finally, he said, we must either have a round beard or we must have a square beard. Is that understood by everyone? And everyone said, yes, I understood. For the last evening, he came down and he watched. He said, I've got it, I've got it, Ralph, I've got it, everyone. Ralph's beard shall be square but round. First scene we made was a simple shot of Ralph coming in a door, hanging up his hat and coat, playing. He said to me, how would you like me to do this? I said, well, there's not many ways of doing it. Then he showed me about, I don't know, eight or 11 ways, and it was like a symphony each time, so effortless, and each one a little bit different. Oh, Father. Have you waited up for me? Yes, Father, I, I have something to tell you. William says very little. He's not a very eloquent man, but he's an amazingly imaginative man. Well, I suppose you'll be going off with him any time now. Yes, if he will have me. Why not? You'll be a most entertaining companion. I will try to be. And your gaiety and brilliance will make up the difference between the 10,000 a year you will have and the 30,000 he expects. He expects nothing. He does not love me for that. No? What else, then? Your grace, your charm, your quick tongue and subtle wit. He admires me. Catherine, I've tried for months not to be unkind, but now it's time for you to realize the truth. How many girls do you think he might have had in this town? 
He finds me pleasing. Oh, yes, I'm sure he does. A hundred women are prettier, a thousand more clever, but you have one virtue that outshines them all. What? What is that? Your money. Oh, father. You have nothing else. Oh. What a terrible thing to say to me. I don't expect you to believe that. I've known you all your life, and I've yet to see you learn anything. With one exception, my dear. You embroider neatly. I'm being accused constantly of being, of having no signature. You know, it's the very big artistic uh, demerit. Yeah, I have no signature because <coughs> you cannot tell a Weiler film from a, another man's films by just looking at it. To me, it's more challenging and more fun, too to do different types of pictures. In Roman Holiday, I had Gregory Peck, who had agreed to do the film. So there was a British director. I asked him to shoot a test of Audrey Hepburn and then conspire with the cameraman and the sound man when he says, cut, scene's finished, that they do not cut. Well, this director did it just right. She jumped out of bed. She said, well, how was it? At this moment, she was at her most attractive. And I said, this is the girl. His attitude is that only simplicity and the truth counts. It has to come from the inside. You can't fake it. That is something I learned from him. 8.30, breakfast here with the embassy staff. 9 o'clock, we leave for the Polinari Automotive Works, where you'll be presented with a small car. Thank you. Which you will not accept. No, thanks. 10.35, inspection of food and agriculture organization will present you with an olive tree. No, thank you. Which you will accept. Thank you. Willie was a great, famous director when I met him, but I didn't really know much about directors. Gregory Peck I knew about. And to do a movie with him, you can imagine what my first picture, what that felt like, you know. We all knew that this was going to be an important star, and we began to talk uh, off camera about the chance that she might win an Academy Award in her first film. Every year I appreciate more that I did receive it. The story itself was very thin. It was an episode in the life of a princess, a Cinderella story in reverse, but, uh, but certainly everything in it represented Willie's humor, Willie's sense of romance. It was Wilder all the way. The mouth of truth. The legend is that if you're given to lying, Put your hand in there, it'll be bitten off. Oh, the hard idea. Let's see you do it. Gifts with comedy were particularly marvelous. The European sensibility and, uh, and also a fellow who was 100% uh, American, a rare combination. There was the one scene that required tears because I had to leave Greg and go back to my palace. I had no idea how to come by these tears. I mean, I'd acted so little. I'm going to that corner there and turn. You will stay in the car and drive away. Promise not to watch me go beyond the corner. And the night was getting longer and longer, and Willie was waiting, and... And out of the blue, he came over to the car and gave me hell. He said, look, we can't stay here all night if you're not going to... Can't you cry, for God's sake? I mean, you know? 
Willie had never spoken to me like that, ever, you know, during the picture. And I broke into such sobs, and he shot the scene, and that was it. I don't know how to say goodbye. I can't think of any words. Don't try it. I'm sorry afterwards, but I had to get you to do it somehow. In the mid-50s, Weiler helped found the Committee for the First Amendment, a group protesting McCarthyism. His films emphasized his basic humanity. Just because Quakers are people of peace, that doesn't mean that they're weak or soft. The principal character in Friendly Persuasion refuses to fight according to Quaker principles. He goes as far as picking up a gun. Taking that gun and not shooting when you're protecting your own life is his greater sign of strength than shooting it. And that's the whole point. Go on, get. I'll not harm thee. The trouble with Quakers is that there aren't enough of them. In the big country, Weiler backtracked to the westerns he had directed in his early days and came up with some new variations on the themes of honor and manliness in the Old West. Big country was debunking the showing off part of cowboys and western cliches, you know. It came in very handy that I used to spend nights trying to think of new ways of getting on or off a horse. One of the key scenes in Big Country, of course, was the fight between me and Greg Peck. I don't know how well Greg understood.